Kicking off the list at number 10 is Ultra Boy. This one is interesting, as you'd be totally forgiven for laughing at this character, but then you'd have to say sorry, as you just insulted an incredibly powerful dude. Ultra Boy, or as he is known in his civilian guise, Joe Na, possesses many of the same superpowers as Superboy, including superhuman speed, strength, flight, stamina, breath, vision, and invulnerability, which he gained from being swallowed by a massive space energy beast, which is essentially a giant space whale, hence the biblical Jonah name. While he was inside the energy beast's stomach, the radiation inside altered Jonah to give him superpowers. Now the only issue with Jonah, and it's a big one, is that he can only use one power at a time. This means that if he wants to fly through space at super speed, he must wear a spacesuit to survive in the cold vacuum, or when using his power for super strength, he is not invulnerable and can therefore get tired, feel muscular pain, or even pull a muscle. Jonah can switch these abilities almost instantly, but needs to make the conscious choice to do so, which honestly sounds kind of exhausting to me. I don't know. Number nine. Puck. The Alpha Flight member known as Puck was at one point literally just a little person who pushed himself to turn his body into an almost perfect physical specimen, able to lift hundreds of pounds and fight as well as his fellow Alpha Flighters. But this was before his Alpha Flight days. He had tons of adventures and his pretty basic but mysterious backstory added to his likability. But that ain't the dumb part. The dumb part came later on when it was revealed that Puck was actually much older than he seemed and was not actually born as a little person. Apparently, Puck used to be seven feet tall and was a mercenary and adventurer who was born near the start of the 20th century. As a merc, he was hired to steal the Black Blade of Baghdad and he totally got it, but then it unleashed an ancient magical being known as Black Razor. In order to defeat the being, Puck sucked him into his own body, becoming immortal in the process, but also losing half of his height and being trapped in the form of a little person. Why couldn't he just be a little person? I don't know. Number eight, Elongated Man. When Ralph Dibney was a tiny little Ralph Dibney, he saw a contortionist at a carnival and he was instantly down to be able to be like that guy. Everyone has their own thing, okay? And for Ralph, his thing was trying to figure out how someone could twist and fold their body into all sorts of shapes like that. Obsessed with learning the secrets of the contortionists, for years and years, Ralph figured out that all the contortionists he observed drank the same drink. Now it's not some crazy form Formula. It's not some kind of tea, but it was actually a popular soft drink known as Gingold. Now Ralph knew for the most part that it was just a coincidence that they all drank the same drink, but that doesn't mean he wasn't gonna bet everything on it. Ralph literally taught himself chemistry, which should be the superpower itself, and he used his newly found chemistry skills to create a super concentrated extract from the fruit that was the basis and heart for Gingold the gingo fruit. And what do you know, the super concentrated extract allowed him to make any part of his body stretch to ridiculous degrees. What's that I hear you say? Why yes, this does make no sense. Number seven, Wally West. Between roughly 1950 and 1970, 90% of superhero origin stories involved either chemicals or radiation. That's just how it worked. The Flash, we are all most familiar with, Barry Allen, became the fastest man alive when he was working at his forensics laboratory one night and a freak bolt of lightning struck his rack of chemicals and also Barry himself. In a stroke of luck, instead of completely frying the guy, the electricity from the lightning mixed with the unique and specific collection of chemicals and it gave Barry Allen super speed and access to the speed force. Now while that origin may give you some pause, it's a classic origin story and most of us has just come to accept it. Now, three years after The Flash debuted, Barry Allen was visited by Wally West, the nephew of Barry's girlfriend, Iris. Wally was a big Flash fan, so Barry took him on a tour of his lab, the very lab where he was struck by lightning. Well. What do you know? A rogue bolt of lightning struck the very same rack of chemicals, all of which were still stored alongside each other, and then the lightning struck Wally West. The electricity mixed with this apparent unique collection of chemicals, unique enough to have it happen twice, and can you guess what happened? Yeah. Wally West gains super speed and access to the speed force. It's not like it doesn't make sense for an event to produce the same outcome, but I guess lightning really do be striking twice, huh? Or we got lazy with the writing. Uh, you pick. 
Number six, Black Condor. A young Richard Gray, who would go on to become the flying superhero Black Condor, was the only survivor of an attack by Mongolian bandits on him and his archaeologist family. Now, stuck alone and in the wild, the little Richard was taken in by a family of condors. In the same way, Mowgli was taken in by wolves and Tarzan was taken in by gorillas. Unfortunately, Richard wasn't a bird. He didn't have the musculature or the feathers or anything really that allows him to take flight like his new family could. But what are millions of years of evolution compared to the human brain and a little bit of practice? Richard spent most of his life studying the birds until he actually managed to teach himself how to just fly. Oh, there was also the exposure to a radioactive meteor, but he truly believed he had taught himself to fly. Once he was discovered by a missionary, Gray headed back home to the United States, where he became the flying adventurer known as the Black Condor. He went back specifically, though, to save a certain U.S. senator. But when it was too late, and he just happened to look exactly like the senator, he decided to abandon the name of Richard Gray and instead took the politician's identity. I think Richard Gray actually just might be insane. I think, yeah. Number five, the flaming carrot. You would be forgiven for not knowing of the superhero known as the flaming carrot. For one, the flaming carrot has been published by different publishers from Aardvark Vanaheim, Renegade Press, and Dark Horse until 2005 when he began being published by Image Comics. The other reason is because look at him. He's utterly ridiculous. His ridiculous look is matched by his equally ridiculous origin though. Essentially, the flaming carrot became a superhero after being bet to read thousands of comic books specifically 5,000 comic books. Somehow, reading 5,000 comic books caused this unknown man to have brain damage, and then he appeared with a giant carrot for a mask, which had apparently an eternal flame on top of it, and he became a crime fighter. That's, that's it. His gear and equipment is pretty equally nuts, too. He has a utility belt, which contains a yo-yo, a lucky rabbit's foot, laughing gas, magnifying glass, band-aids with little stars and rockets on them, silly putty, a skeleton, skeleton key, stink bombs, a decoder badge, Pez candy, a magnet, a bubble pipe, super glue, a wishbone, trading cards, invisible ink, sneeze powder, and fizzies. That's his gear, alongside a nuclear powered pogo stick and flippers that he wears at all times, just in case he has to swim, cause you never know. Number four, Wizard. Bob Frank and his father Emil were traveling through Africa when they both unfortunately came down with an extremely deadly illness. Needing a transfusion in order to save their lives, Emil made it a mission to find someone who would be willing to help them and to save Bob's life. Apparently, there was absolutely no one who could help them out. But then, to make matters so much more worse, Bob also got bitten by a very deadly cobra. Bob was not having a good go of things here. When that happened, a mongoose then just showed up and it introduced that snake to the afterlife. Of course, this must have been a sign and Emil had the idea to use the mongoose for the transfusion instead of a human to save his son's life. <laughs> Don't worry about how a mongoose and a human are completely different. He was going to save his son's life, goddammit, okay? He was gonna do it. Now, not only did the mongoose DNA running through his veins actually save his life, but naturally this had the added benefit of allowing Bob to now run at super speed. Apparently this was also just common information as Emil explained it as nonchalantly as pouring a cup of tea. Later on, it would be revealed that Frank had natural powers that were just jump-started by the addition of the mongoose DNA, but of course, that's only after the writers realized how that makes no sense. Number three, Fat Man the Human Flying Saucer. Once upon a time, there was a pretty ordinary wealthy man by the name of Van Crawford. Van was an expert on all things hobbies, and he owned a string of hobby shops. Well, Van here just happened to be waltzing along when he spied, in his little eye, an alien flying saucer crashing into the earth. Now being such a nice guy, Van decided to clear the space for the saucer to land, even pushing over a tree to do so. Very nice. Crawford came face to face with an alien, and it turns out that this alien was the flying saucer he had seen. This race of aliens seems to be able to transform from their normal form into a flying saucer, which is honestly a pretty spectacular ability to have. Luckily for Van though, after the alien gave him a drink that seemed to look and taste like a chocolate milkshake, he also gained this awesome and unique ability to transform himself into a human flying saucer. It's honestly really fun and kind of super charming that I really enjoy it, and uh, I think we can all agree that it's kind of dumb still though. 
Number two, Spider-Ham. Hailing from a universe where all the Marvel characters are replaced with cartoon character, animal versions of themselves, Peter Porker is Spider-Ham. A pig. Peter Porker was actually born a spider named Peter, and he lived in the basement lab of May Porker, a scientist who had created the world's first atomic powered hair dryer. May Porker, using the atomic hair dryer, accidentally irradiated herself, and then she bit Peter the spider, which made him turn into an anthropomorphic pig, just like her, only with the relative powers of a spider. In his premiere issue, he would go on to do battle with Hulk Bunny, created when Bruce Bunny was trapped in an arcade cabinet and bombarded with gamma radiation. I wish I was making this all up, I really do, but it's also kind of awesome. Spider-Ham has most of the same abilities as 616 Spider-Man, only he has the rather unique ability called Spider-Nonsense, which basically allows him to be more and more cartoony the more danger he is in, which is the perfect reason to have the wackiest nonsense happen that will save his piggy hide in some of the most imaginative ways possible. In at number one, the Red Bee. The Red Bee from DC Comics comes from a time in comic books and the superhero genre when superheroes were really just pulp vigilantes who had some kind of really minor edge over the criminals they would be thwarting. Rick Rally was the assistant to the district attorney and with this look at the criminal justice system, he grew tired of seeing criminals escape justice either through technicalities or because the court system was just too slow. Growing fed up, Rick decided he would create a costumed identity to bring criminals to to justice. But as a normal, pretty intelligent guy with a flawless moral compass and a decent right hook, he didn't really have an edge over those he was facing. Enter Michael. Michael was a trained bee like the insect that Rick would keep in his belt buckle. Rick was a unique kind of bee though. As we know, bees don't survive for too long after they sting someone. Luckily though, Michael had the advantage of being able to sting multiple times. Michael, coupled with Rick's fists and other equipment would be the bane of villains everywhere and thus the red bee was born. Number 10, Hitmonkey. Hitmonkey, huh, oh man, I love Hitmonkey. Initially, Hitmonkey was just a monkey living up in the mountains until a human assassin wandered wounded into his clan. They took in the human and nursed him back to health. The monkey who had become Hitmonkey was nervous about the man's presence and at one point rebelled against his clan for their decision to continue to offer refuge to the assassin. Monkey violently struck out and was banished as a result. However, during his time away, he spotted other armed men in the wilderness and rushed back to warn his clan. But unfortunately, he got there too late. They had all been killed in the attack, with the assassin also dying. Swearing to get revenge, Hitmonkey was born that day, as he wielded the assassin's guns and would continue to be guided by the spirit of the dead assassin, who helped him on his quest and also sought to resolve his own unfinished business through Hitmonkey. <laughs> and friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love weird, wacky list like this, click that subscribe button. We do a lot of cool stuff like this and you're not gonna wanna miss it when it does pop up. Number nine, Green Lantern. In part two, we talked about the original origin of Alan Scott's Green Lantern, but now we're gonna talk about the amazing and also unbelievable origin of one of the newer Green Lanterns, Sojourner Moline. Jo has a fascinating origin in the sense that she was chosen to become Green Lantern for a sector of space known only as the Far Sector. That's how far out it is. It does not have a designated number. It's just Far Sector. Also interesting and unique is that Joe's Green Lantern ring that she was given is a special kind that is basically self-charging, doesn't need a battery, making it perfect for cases out in remote areas of space. However, while this is a great strength and some would consider this ring to be like one of the strongest, it can also be somewhat of a weakness because it actually takes time to recharge by itself, meaning that Joe has to be a little bit more conservative and creative at times when using her powers in battle, being careful not to fully tap herself out unless, you know, she absolutely has to, but she has to make those choices. That's what makes it so exciting. Number eight, Elasti Woman. Whether we're talking comics or the live action Doom Patrol series, Elasti Woman has a pretty interesting origin. She was initially a Hollywood actress, Rita Farr. In the Doom Patrol series, it's implied that she was cursed for being rude to locals while on set, falling into a body of water where she was exposed to a toxic gas that left her with the uncontrollable ability to shapeshift. Ultimately, 
this kind of ruined her career. In the comics, it was exposure to toxic gas from a volcano while on a shoot in Africa that gave her this ability. Also, of course, ruining her career. She would end up joining Niles Calder's team of misfits known as the Doom Patrol. In the live action series, Rita constantly struggles to control her abilities. In the comics, she also becomes the adopted mother of Garfield Logan's Beast Boy, who we often nickname Gar, after marrying Steve Dayton's Mento, another member of the Doom Patrol team. Number 7. Rogue Well, when it comes to Rogue, she's a pretty tragic and honestly pretty wild backstory. Initially, we knew her as a villain in the comics, but this wouldn't last too long. With Rogue eventually leaving her adoptive mother's sides and joining the X-Men. From the beginning of her origins, Rogue's backstory has been pretty wild. She was initially born into a hippie commune out in the wilderness. Her mother ended up disappearing in a mystical ritual when she was young, which left Anna Marie to be raised by her stern Aunt Carrie her mother, Priscilla's sister, and her often absent father, Owen. Eventually, Anna Marie would run away from home, gaining the nickname of Rogue because, you know, she kept to herself, which would eventually also become her codename as a super. She would end up being taken in by Mystique and her wife, Destiny, with the two villainesses becoming, you guessed it, Rogue's adoptive mothers. Initially, Rogue's powers manifested during her first kiss with her childhood crush, Cody Robbins. As a result, Cody's life energy was drained from the physical contact and he was left comatose. Thanks to this very traumatizing experience, for years, Rogue struggled to control her powers, often choosing to wear clothes that fully covered her body for fear of accidentally hurting those closest to her. It wasn't until recently in the comics that she managed to gain better control over her mutant abilities when she finally confronted her fears, realizing that it was actually her own fear that had been preventing her from controlling her powers the whole time. Number 6. Oracle When you think about it, Oracle's origins are pretty insane. I still can't believe this happened, considering the story that her origin comes from is not even fully canon. Oracle is Barbara Gordon, and we aren't talking about Barbara Gordon's initially confusing connection to Commissioner Jim Gordon and her origin as Batgirl here, but instead her transformation from Batgirl to Oracle with her Oracle origin. This all went down in Killing Joke, initially intended to be a one-off story that was not part of the main continuity canon. And for the most part, it really isn't. However, in the story, Barbara Gordon is visiting with her father, Jim Gordon. Dressed as a civilian, she answers the door and is shot through the spine by the Joker. And for some reason, this is the part of the story that was kept and incorporated into canon. The silver lining is it gave us Oracle, I suppose, which is a super cool character. But the unfortunate thing is it created a lot of trauma and extra struggle for Babs, with her also having to retire as Batgirl for quite some time. Number 5. Red Hood We're not talking about Jason Todd's origins as Robin here, instead we're talking about his origin as Red Hood. And I know that some may consider Red Hood to be more a villain at times or anti-hero, but one, anti-heroes are still also heroes, and two, I would consider Todd's Red Hood more of a straight up hero right now than well, anything else. I mean, he did switch from guns to a crowbar. It's still pretty brutal, but hey, progress. Jason Todd became the Red Hood after he was believed to have been killed by the Joker. First of all, this death was actually voted on by fans, which is a pretty wild marketing strategy and pretty crazy that that's part of this origin. And after he died, his death was considered to be one of the actual mainstay deaths in comics, with the three permanent deaths in comics at one point being considered to be uncle Ben, Bucky Barnes, and of course, Jason Todd. Evidently, not so permanent as two out of three of those characters have now, at this point in time, ended up returning. Albeit, you know, after a long period, I will say, of staying dead, unlike most other fallen heroes and characters. Jason returned, however, as the villain Red Hood. In the story, it was explained that he was revived via time spent in basically the Lazarus pits, being taken in and trained by Talia al Ghul and the League of Assassins. That's kind of like how he recovered and how how he became Red Hood a little bit. However, do you even know how any of that was made possible? Hmm? What well, was actually a change made to the universe that was one of many explained by Superboy Prime punching reality? Yeah, even more bizarre, the punch actually happened in terms of the comics continuity in terms of their release dates after Todd returned. But that's explained by the fact that Superboy Prime's punch actually affected all of reality throughout time. So while it did happen afterward in terms of when the comics were released, it affected the past, which means Jason Todd actually came back to life six months after his death in the adjusted canon. 
which would actually even be like way back when. So people were like, but didn't this happen after? And it's like, yes, but like this actually doesn't even, it affects way in the past, really. Oh, Superboy Prime, punch in reality. Number four, Ben Riley. Ben Riley is a superhero who we would often come to know mainly as Scarlet Spider. But before that, we actually just knew him for a while as Spider-Man. He is the clone of Peter Parker who was created by the Jackal, although there was a period of time where Peter and Ben were not sure which one of them was the clone. And it was even believed that Ben may actually be the original, with Peter being the clone. Beyond that, Ben Riley, while being created by Miles Warren's Jackal and tormented by the villain, would also at one point go on to adopt the name for himself, becoming the Jackal, which is pretty messed up when you think about everything that's happened to Ben Riley. Number three, Robot Man. Cliff Steele is DC's Robot Man. For those unfamiliar, he is one of the mainstays on DC's oddball superhero team, the Doom Patrol. Whether we're talking about the live action adaptation or the comic book origin for this character, both are honestly pretty similar and pretty weird. Basically, Cliff Steele was a NASCAR driver, additionally in the comics, an obsessive thrill seeker, not exclusively a race car driver alone, and during a car accident, his body ends up being destroyed. With his brain still surviving, however, his life was saved by Niles Calder, who gave him a cybernetic body, which is how he became Robot Man. Unfortunately, a much more rudimentary robot body, though, than other superheroic cyborgs like, well, Cyborg. <laughs> in the live action series Doom Patrol, Cliff's origin is made even more unbelievable. And we learned that this version of the accident happened not on the track, but after the race while on the way home. Cliff had been having an affair and his wife found out. But at the same time, he also found out that his wife had found out and then so she had had an affair and she let him know kind of in the worst time possible. She revealed this to him during his race, causing him to almost get in a life threatening car crash. The two, however, after the race decided to renew their commitment to one another and ultimately try to salvage their marriage. I guess you know, a near death experience can do that to you. While on their way home with their young daughter Clara in the back seat, Cliff ended up getting into an accident tragically with a large logging truck. The accident cost his wife her life, Cliff his body, and left his daughter alive but severely traumatized. Even more wild, in the show, we'd actually later learn that Cliff getting into this accident was kind of all part of Niall Calder's experiments as he sought to find a way to become immortal. Now that is unbelievable. Number two, Longshot. Longshot is the son of Shatterstar and he's from Mojo World. So he's pretty much as weird as it gets just with that. Longshot was basically created as a clone of Shatterstar who ended up being sent back in time to the Mojoverse by Mephisto. But it also gets even weirder for this character when you factor in his jumps back and forth from the Mojoverse to Earth and back again. And it gets even weirder when you factor in Shatterstar's origins. Number one, Shatterstar. As I said, to really appreciate the mind-blowing nature of Longshot's origins, you need to know Shatterstar. So Shatterstar is actually the biological son of Longshot and another mutant with a weird origin story, Dazzler, who we talked about on part two of this series. Which of course means that Shatterstar and Longshot are in essence one another's fathers, in a way, <laughs> with both their origins being tied up in what I would call a time paradox. I think that's what that is for sure. Longshot is Shatterstar's father, but after traveling back in time, Shatterstar's DNA would be taken and used to create Longshot. In essence, also making him Longshot's genetic father. So yeah, they're both each other's fathers, they both exist, and they're both really confusing. There's no better place to start than with Spider-Woman. Born in 1924, a little tiny Jessica Drew traveled with her parents, Jonathan and Miriam, to Mount Wondergore. There, her father Jonathan conducted genetics research with one Dr. Herbert Wyndham, who would later go on to become the incredibly powerful High Evolutionary. At seven years old, Jessica contracted uranium poisoning from her father's work, but Jonathan and Wyndham managed to actually save her life using a spider-derived serum and combining it with years and years of hibernation in a genetic accelerator. Jessica then spent decades in stasis, receiving subliminal education via special tapes, kind of like how baby Superman was instilled with his values and all that jazz when traveling through space to Earth. When she finally awakened, she was cured and had only aged up to her early teens. She also discovered that she now possessed superhuman powers as a result of the combination 
combination of the radiation exposure and the spider serum. But then, later, it was said that her actual origin was because of a failed experiment that exposed Jessica's pregnant mom to radiation, which managed to give Jessica spider powers when she was born. Either way, when she first showed up in comic books in Marvel Spotlight number 32, she had become an agent of Hydra and was sent on a mission to try and wipe out the director of S.H.I.E.L.D., Nick Fury. Luckily, he brought her to the light side. But moving on from Spider-Woman to something completely insane, Bob Frank and his father Emil were traveling through Africa when they both unfortunately came down with an extremely deadly illness. Needing a transfusion in order to save their lives, Emil made it a mission to find someone who would be willing to help them and to save Bob's life. Apparently, there was absolutely no one who could help them out. But then, to make matters so much worse, Bob also also got bitten by a very deadly cobra. Bob was not having a good time. When that happened, a mongoose then just showed up and it introduced that snake to the afterlife. Of course, this must have been a sign, and Emil had the idea to use this mongoose for the transfusion instead of a regular human being to save his son's life. Not only did the mongoose DNA running through his veins somehow actually save his life, but naturally, this had the added benefit of allowing Bob to now run at super speed. Apparently, this was just common information as Emil explained it as nonchalantly as pouring a cup of tea. Later on, it would be revealed that Frank had natural powers that were just jump-started by the addition of the mongoose DNA, but of course, that's only after they realized how that makes no sense. But moving on from that, a young Richard Gray, who would go on to become the flying superhero known as Black Condor, was the only survivor of an attack by Mongolian bandits on him and his arch archaeologist family. Now, stuck alone and in the wild, the little Richard was taken in by a family in the same kind of way that Mowgli was taken in by wolves and Tarzan was taken in by gorillas. Unfortunately, Richard was not a bird, though. He didn't have the musculature or the feathers or anything really that allowed him to take flight like his new family could. But what are millions of years of evolution compared to the human brain and a little bit of practice? Richard spent most of his life studying the birds until he actually managed to just teach himself how to fly. Oh, there was also the exposure to a radioactive meteor that may have had something to do with it, but he truly believed that he had taught himself to fly. Once he was discovered by a missionary, Gray headed back home to the United States where he became the flying adventurer known as the Black Condor. He went back specifically to save a certain US senator, but when he was actually too late, he just happened to look exactly like the senator, so he decided to abandon the name of Richard Gray and instead took the politician's identity. I think Richard Gray might actually just be insane. Now, between roughly 1950 and 1970, 90% of superhero origin stories involved either chemicals or radiation. That's just kind of how it worked. The Flash we are all most familiar with, Barry Allen, became the fastest man alive when he was working at his forensic laboratory one night, Vault of Lightning struck his rack of chemicals and also Barry himself. In a stroke of luck, instead of completely frying the guy, the electricity from the lightning mixed with the unique and specific collection of chemicals, and it gave Barry Allen super speed and access to the speed force. While that may give you some pause, it's a classic origin story, and most of us have just come to accept it now. Three years after The Flash debuted, Barry Allen was visited by Wally West, the nephew of Barry's girlfriend, Iris West. Wally was a big fan of The Flash, so Barry took him on a tour of his lab, the very lab where he was struck by lightning and gained his powers. Well, what do you know? A rogue bolt of lightning struck the very same rack of chemicals, all of which were still stored alongside each other, and then the lightning struck Wally West. The electricity mixed with this apparent unique collection of chemicals, and can you guess what happened? Yeah, Wally West gained super speed and access to the speed force. It's not like it doesn't make sense for the same event to produce the same outcome, but I guess lightning really do be striking twice, I guess. Or we got lazy with the writing. I'll let you pick. But while you're deciding on that, did you ever just randomly, accidentally drink a formula for creating super plastic, thinking that it was soda instead? 
Has that ever happened to you? No, it probably hasn't. And if it did, you'd probably need to be rushed to the hospital. That's because we live in the real world. But in DC Comics, all logic just goes out the window. So when Chuck Tane mistook a super plastic formula for soda pop and downed the whole thing down his gullet, instead of needing urgent medical attention, he instead gained the ability to inflate himself to a ridiculous degree and bounce around with enough speed and velocity to actually make him incredibly efficient in combat. Chuck went on to become a key member of the 30th century's Legion of Superheroes as Bouncing Boy, and I think I've said enough about him. Alan Scott was the first ever original Green Lantern, but while the other lanterns that we have come into contact with were test pilots, veteran soldiers, and comic book artists who were chosen to become members of an intergalactic core of space cops, Alan Scott was a train engineer, saved from what would have been a fatal train accident by a magical green engineer's lantern made thousands of years ago in China out of a meteorite. But get this, the meteorite in question actually housed the spirit known as the Star Heart that needed to fulfill a prophecy to bring death, life, and power. Apparently, the spirit had already at some point in the past brought death and life already, so when it came upon Alan Scott, it was time to bring power in the form of his unique magical power ring. The funny thing was that even when DC Comics created Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps, Alan's origins remained exactly the same. Only change came when Jeff Johns made it so that the Star Heart used to be an experiment that the Guardians of Oa were unable to contain. As it made its way to Earth in the form of a meteorite to one day save Alan Scott, it took some inspiration from the Green Lantern Corps, seemingly influencing Scott to take the Green Lantern name. But the weirdest thing about this whole origin is that Alan Scott's main weakness is wood. What's up with that? I don't know. But from one strange lantern to another, the son of a poor farmer, Daniel Cormack, was raised in Ireland. Like most Irish people, he came into contact with the sea. They're basically an Irish fairy people, some of whom he managed to become really good pals with. Now it turns out that the fairies actually really liked Daniel because Maeve, the fairy queen, granted him a magical lantern as repayment for his friendship to the fairy people. The power of this lantern is interesting. It slowly waxes until its peak at midnight and then slowly wanes after until it is at its weakest at noon. Now with his lantern, Jack is able to fly, teleport himself or others, generate blasts of energy, create illusions, generate fog, change the size of enemies and bind them inside the lantern and he can also become superhumanly strong and durable. That's a great set of powers. Now using the lantern, he took up the identity of Jack O'Lantern and became Ireland's premier superhero, eventually joining the global Guardians, even getting two successors in the form of Marvin Noronza and eventually Liam McHugh. Now, coming up in our third to last spot today, a lot of comic book superhero origins have to do with some kind of accident. A freak lightning bolt, an interrupted gamma explosion, an alien plane crash, it's just how it goes. But for professional saxophone blower Johnny Domino, aka the Nightman, his mysterious abilities to hear evil thoughts, see at night, no longer require sleep, psychically control a length of rope, and produce lightning through a connection to Celtic magic, all came about when he was just driving his Miata through the San Francisco Bay Area and an out of control streetcar, which got hit by magic lightning, crashed into him. Johnny Domino ended up in a coma for several weeks and when he finally came back to, boom, powers. Not a bad deal until you learn that the big old downside to all of his powers is that he is now a cannibal. Nightman needs to literally consume a broth consisting of a handful of human organs every couple of months in order for him to stay alive. Reading that made me nauseous. Also, the Nightman even had his own short-lived TV show, and if you haven't seen the intro for that show, trust me, you gotta check it out. And in for our runner-up spot today, when Ralph Dibney of DC Comics was a tiny little Ralph Dibney, he saw a contortionist at a carnival, and he was instantly down to be just like that guy. Everyone has their thing, and for Ralph, his thing was trying to figure out how someone could twist and fold their body into all sorts of shapes like that guy could. Obsessed with learning the secrets of the contortionists, for years and and years, Ralph figured out that all the contortionists he observed drank the same drink. Not some crazy
Pepsi formula, not some kind of tea, but it was actually a popular soft drink known as Gingle. Now, Ralph knew for the most part that it was just a coincidence that they all drank the same drink, but that doesn't mean he wasn't gonna bet everything he had on it. Ralph ended up literally teaching himself chemistry, which should be the superpower here, and then he used these newly found chemistry abilities to create a super concentrated extract from the fruit that was the basis and heart for the Gingold drink, the Gingo fruit. What do you know, the super concentrated extract allowed him to make any part of his body stretch to ridiculous degrees. What's that I hear you say? Yeah, it doesn't make any sense, you're right. But finally, coming in at our number one spot today, the Flaming Carrot has been published by different publishers all over the place, so I'd forgive you for not knowing who he is. From Aardvark, Vanaheim, Renegade Press, and Dark Horse Comics until 2005, when he began being published by Image Comics. Other reason that you may not know who he is is because, Look at him, he's utterly ridiculous. His utterly ridiculous look is matched by his equally ridiculous origin story. Essentially, the Flaming Carrot became a superhero after deciding to read 5,000 comic books in a row. Curiously, for him, reading that many comics caused the unknown man to get brain damage. He then donned a giant carrot for a mask, which was topped with an eternal flame, and he became a crime fighter. His gear and equipment is pretty equally nuts. He has a utility belt, which carries a yo-yo, lucky rabbit's foot, laughing gas, a magnifying glass, band-aids with little stars and rockets on them, silly putty, a skeleton key, stick bombs, a decoder badge, Pez candy, a magnet, a bubble pipe, super glue, a wishbone, training cards, invisible ink, sneeze powder, and fizzies. That's his gear, alongside a nuclear-powered pogo stick, which is in his mask, and flippers that he wears at all times, just in case he has to swim. Number 10, The Creeper. Jack Ryder was a super outspoken TV news guy in Gotham City. Now on TV, he's the host of a show where he tries to stir the pot to get everyone talking about topics like super advanced medical science and nanotech. Ryder was doing some investigating into some new tech called nanocell therapy created by one Dr. Vincent Yatz. He discovered an experimental mixture which enabled the body to regenerate from practically any injury of any kind. Unfortunately though, Jack tried to steal Yatz's tech at the same time as a group of mobsters, and so to keep the tech safe, the good old doctor injected his last unstable sample of nanocells into Jack Ryder. Then, right after that happens, the gangsters grant Jack a one-way ticket to the afterlife and blow his head off. Now, most of us, well, we'd be lights out and game over by that. But thanks to the nanocells reacting with his body's chemistry, Jack is completely resurrected with the ability to turn into the Creeper. This bright yellow skinned, green haired madman with hypnotic intimidation powers, a pain inducing laugh, and superhuman agility ability, strength, speed, stamina, and enhanced reflexes. Number 9, Ultra Boy. Ultra Boy, or as he is known in his civilian guise, Joe Na, possesses many of the same powers as Superboy, including superhuman speed, strength, flight, stamina, breath, vision, and invulnerability, which he gained from being swallowed by a massive space energy beast, which is essentially a giant space whale, hence the biblical Joe Na name. While he was inside the energy beast's stomach, the radiation inside altered Joe Na to give him superpowers. The only issue with Joe Na, and it's a big one, is that he can only use one power at a time. This means that if he wants to fly through space at super speed, he must wear a spacesuit to survive in the cold vacuum. Or when using his power for super strength, he is not invulnerable and can therefore get tired, feel muscular pain or even pull a muscle. Joe Na can switch these abilities almost instantly, but he needs to make the conscious choice to do so, which honestly sounds exhausting. Number eight, Jack O'Lantern. The son of a poor farmer, Daniel Cormack was raised in Ireland. Now, like most Irish people, Daniel came into contact with the Irish fairy people, some of whom he managed to become good pals with. It turns out that the fairies actually really liked Daniel because Maeve, the fairy queen, granted him a magical lantern as repayment for his friendship to the fairies. The power of this lantern is 
pretty interesting. It slowly waxes until its peak at midnight and then slowly wanes until it's at its weakest at noon. With his lantern, Jack is able to fly, teleport himself or others, generate blasts of energy, create illusions, generate fog, change the size of enemies and bind them inside the lantern. And he can also become superhumanly strong and durable. Using the lantern, he took up the identity of Jack O' Lantern and became Ireland's premier superhero. Eventually joining the Global Guardians, even getting two successors in the form of Marvin Noronza and eventually Liam McHugh. Number seven, the Red Bee. The Red Bee from DC Comics comes from a time in comic books and the superhero genre when superheroes were really just pulp vigilantes who had some kind of really minor edge over the criminals they would be thwarting. Rick Rally was the assistant to the district attorney and with this look at the criminal justice system, he grew tired of seeing criminals escape justice either through technicalities or because the court system was just too slow. Growing fed up with this, Rick decided he would create a costumed identity to bring criminals to justice. But as a normal intelligent guy with a flawless moral compass and a decent right hook, he didn't really have an edge over those he was facing. Enter Michael. Michael was a trained bee, like the insect that Rick would keep in his belt buckle. Michael was a unique kind of bee though. As we know, bees don't survive for too long after they sting someone, and luckily, Michael had the advantage of being able to sting people multiple times. Michael, coupled with Rick's fists and other equipment, would be the bane of villains everywhere, and thus, the red bee was born. Number six. Cloud. There's really no other way to say this. Marvel's Cloud is a sentient nebula hundreds of thousands of years away from becoming a star. That's actually what they are. Cloud began to notice stars disappearing from the space surrounding it, which caused the nebula to feel fear for some reason. And because of that, a newly emerged cosmic cube known as Cubic was attracted to Cloud and came to their aid. Now, hoping that the Earth's heroes could somehow do something to help, Cloud made their way to our planet planet only to it inadvertently cause a young couple, Carol Faber and Danny Milligan, to get distracted while driving and crash their car. When Cloud attempted to help the couple, they tried to enter into their minds but were instead bombarded with the unique human psyche. For some reason, this transformed Cloud into a replica of Carol, with no memories of their former self. This made Cloud the perfect target for the Secret Empire, which is a cult-like offshoot of Hydra that then weaponized Cloud to suit their own nefarious ends before she was eventually taken on to the Defenders team. Number five, Elongated Man. When Ralph Dibney was a tiny little Ralph Dibney, he saw a contortionist at a carnival and he was instantly down to be able to be like that guy. Everyone had their thing, and for Ralph, his thing was trying to figure out how someone could twist and fold their body into all sorts of shapes like a contortionist could. Obsessed with learning the secrets of the contortionists, for years and years, Ralph figured out that all the contortionists he observed drank the same drink. Not some crazy formula, not some kind of tea, but it was actually a popular soft drink known as Gingold. Now, Ralph knew for the most part that it was just a coincidence that they all drink the same drink. But that doesn't mean he wasn't gonna bet everything he had on it. Ralph literally taught himself chemistry and he used his newly found chemistry skills to create a super concentrated extract from the fruit that was the basis and heart for Gingold, the Gingo fruit. And what do you know, the super concentrated extract allowed him to make any part of his body stretch to a ridiculous degree. What's that I hear you say? Why yes, this does make no sense. Number four, Flex Mentallo. The Doom Patrol is a unique team to say the least. Their whole thing is that their powers are weird enough that they were shunned, made fun of, etc, etc, and so they pulled together to make their own team. A bunch of them could make this list, but the one member who I think deserves to make it onto this list is Flex Mentallo. He first appeared in Doom Patrol Volume 2, number 35 in 1990, and was essentially created by another metahuman by the name of Wallace Sage. Wallace has the ability to take any drawing he makes and turn it into to real life. With that power, he created Flex. Now, Flex himself was given the mysterious and kind of hilarious power of muscle mystery, which allows him to alter reality by flexing 
different muscles. For example, flexing his scalenus minimus, Flex has the ability to survive in the vacuum of space for an extended amount of time. His other powers include enhanced senses, mind control, precognition, reality alteration, superhuman durability, superhuman strength, and telepathy, all by flexing different muscles. Number three, Puck. The Alpha Flight member known as Puck was at one point literally just a little person who pushed himself to turn his body into an almost perfect physical specimen, able to lift hundreds of pounds and fight as well as his fellow Alpha Flighters. But this was before his Alpha Flight days. He had tons of adventures and his pretty basic but mysterious backstory added to his likability. Now the dumb part came much later on when it was revealed that Puck was actually much older than he seemed and was not actually born as a little person. Apparently, Puck used to be 7 feet tall and was a mercenary and adventurer who was born near the start of the 20th century. As a merc, he was hired to steal the Black Blade of Baghdad, and he totally did it, but then it unleashed an ancient magical being known as Black Razor. In order to defeat Black Razor, Puck sucked him into his own body, becoming immortal in the process, but also losing half of his height and being trapped in the form of a little person. Why? I don't know. Number two, Wizard. Bob Frank and his father Emil were traveling through Africa when they both unfortunately came down with an extremely deadly illness. Now, needing a transfusion in order to save their lives, Emil made it a mission to find someone who would be willing to help them and to save Bob's life. Apparently, there was absolutely no one who could help them out. But then, to make matters so much more worse, Bob also got bitten by a very deadly cobra. Bob was not having a good go of things here. And when that happened, a mongoose then just happened to show up and it introduced that snake to the afterlife. Now of course, this must have been a sign and Emil had the bright idea to use this mongoose for the blood transfusion to save his own son's life. Don't worry about how a mongoose and a human are completely different, he was going to save his son's life. It. Not only did the mongoose DNA running through his son's veins save his life, but naturally this had the added benefit of allowing Bob to now run at super speed? Apparently though, this was just common information as Emil explained it as nonchalantly as pouring a cup of tea. Later on, it would be revealed that Frank had natural powers that were just jump started by the addition of the mongoose DNA, but of course that's only after they realized how that makes no sense. And in at number one today, is Liesl Pawn. The Green Lantern Corps, actually every Lantern Corps really, has members of all different shapes and sizes. But what utterly baffles me personally is knowing that the Green Lanterns have a super intelligent, justice seeking smallpox virus on their roster. Assigned to Sector 119, Liesl Pawn wasn't really able to join the other lanterns in team meetings on the Green Lantern world because this lantern risked infecting all the others. Liesl Pawn's partner in Sector 119 was called Remus. Now, I say was because Remus was a fatal victim of Despotelis, another sentient virus and also part of the Yellow Lantern Corps, the Sinestro Corps. Despotelis infected 85% of the planets in Sector 119, which caused the passing of Liesl's partner. Despotelis then went on to infect Guy Gardner. Now, wanting revenge for the attack on her sector and the loss of Remus, Liesl Pawn was injected into Guy Gardner and then did battle with Despotelis inside of Guy Gardner, defeating and capturing the Yellow Lantern virus, who Liesl brought back to Oa for a Green Lantern doctor to work on a vaccine to wipe out Despotelis tell us for good. And that's all I know about this character. Coming in at number 10 today is Galactus. Being one of the constants in Marvel Comics since 1965, Galactus is a big name in comic books, and yet I feel like there's a good chunk of people who may not know his origins. Galactus was known originally as the space explorer Galen from a planet called Ta. The civilization he belongs to was the most advanced of any of the known universes at that time, and Galen was a genetically engineered child of one of Ta's greatest scientists. But Galen and his society existed in the previous iteration of the Marvel multiverse, the sixth cosmos. Essentially, in Marvel, the universe starts off as a cosmic egg, or a sphere of disorganized, dense, compact matter. This sphere undergoes a big bang that hurls the matter outwards, where it eventually condenses into
into stars, planets, moons and all that good stuff. It all expands in size for billions of years and then it begins to go in reverse, undergoing a quote crunch over the next billions of years, all heading toward a central point in the universe where it all restarts again. That or it was a giant entity known as the Black Winter. Either way, Galen and the surviving people of Ta attempted to face the end of the universe by leaving their planet on a ship. Sadly, the cataclysm caught up with the ship and everyone passed except for Galen, who was approached by the sentience of the universe who merged his power with Galen, allowing him to survive as Galactus, the devourer of worlds in the next cosmos. This one. Number 9. Parasite Joshua Michael Allen When talking about the origin story of the villain Parasite, there are a few different stories we can tell. But they're all nuts. The most current version of Parasite is a guy who used to go by the name Joshua Michael Allen. Josh was originally a bike courier from Metropolis, but his life changed when he very randomly came face to face with a massive green booger looking monster. He was having a rough time and so he kind of snapped, attacking the monster and getting a massive electric shock. He then lost consciousness. When he came to, he was diagnosed as suffering from alien flu. He also lost his job and got dumped by his GF in the same stroke, so that's pretty sad. It was then that he was called into Star Labs to be checked for the virus. All of a sudden, a random explosion at the lab took out everyone nearby and transformed Joshua into a purple grotesque monster called Parasite. As Parasite, he uncontrollably and suffering from a crazy level of hunger, drained the energy of people around him, leaving them as husks. However, the Man of Steel came to intervene and when Parasite touched Superman, he gained way more energy than he had from anyone before. From that point forward, the leeching metahuman powers became his new obsession. Number 8. Solomon Grundy Cyrus Gold lived a pretty miserable life. His father, Gold Sr., had moved to Gotham City to gain fame and fortune and failed miserably. The Elder Gold began to use his family as a way to vent off the hate he felt towards his superiors. For years, the young Cyrus Gold was mistreated, coming to a head when his mother packed her belongings, kissed him goodbye, and abandoned him alone with his horrible father. Not too much later, Cyrus snuck down to the docks to watch his father work when a crate fell on top of Cyrus Gold's father, taking him out of the picture instantly. Now, Cyrus Gold was all alone. Forced to survive on nothing, he swore to himself to make his own riches and power. And miraculously, a mysterious stranger offered Cyrus the deal of a lifetime. He could become rich and powerful if he only served the stranger until the day he died. Cyrus Gold shook the stranger's hand and what do you know, he soon became wealthy and powerful, but by ways not very honest. He took people's lives, including his mother and various people who had bullied him in the past. He stole and he became a horrible mobster, notorious for dumping the bodies of his victims in the waters of Slaughter Swamp. During this period, Cyrus somehow got married and had a little boy and a little girl as well. Initially, they were a happy family, but Cyrus became a worse and worse husband until, in a fit of rage, Cyrus took his wife's life. A mob formed and chased him into the swamps. Now, Cyrus didn't want to go by the mob's hands, and subsequently, he stuck himself through the heart, sinking into the cursed waters of Slaughter Swamp. Now, the swamp filled with unknown acids and chemicals bonded to the preserving corpse of Cyrus Gold, fusing his body through time with wood, stone, and pretty much anything else that was unlucky enough to fall into the swamp. Fifty years later, after his passing, something happened. In the dead of night, a moaning was heard. The waters rippled and parted as a hideously decayed white hand reached out. That night, from the remains of a selfish and evil man, came a hulking avatar of the Grey known only as Solomon Grundy, naming himself after after a famous poem. That was a long one, I'm sorry. Number 7, Killer Croc. As with most DC characters, Killer Croc, aka Waylon Jones, has two main origin stories, the pre and post Flashpoint origins, with some minor differences. Born in a slum in Tampa, Florida, Waylon was born with a congenital medical condition that caused him to have scaly thick skin and reptilian features, which led to the Croc part of his name. This is true in both origins, although post Flashpoint this condition was given a bit more depth as Waylon tried to scrub away the scales for years. Now, with his mother passing away from his birth and his father abandoning the little croc, Waylon was raised by his aunt, but she had a bit of a problem with the drinky. As a teenager, Croc had no friends and was bullied for his medical condition, as is usually the case in a villain origin story. So, instead, Waylon grew up and found himself literally wrestling alligators as part of carnivals. Post Flashpoint, this was the Gotham Circus, where he even came into contact with the Flying Graysons. This 
was where he earned the name Killer Croc. But carnivals aren't exactly swimming in the cash. And post Flashpoint, his boss was keeping his money, prompting Croc to bite off his arm. Croc soon realized that there was more money to be made in crime, so he set out to become Gotham's most powerful crime lord, taking out other rising criminals, gathering up some henchmen, and seizing control of the Tobacconist Club and or the Gotham City sewers, bringing him into conflict with the Batman. Number 6 Professor Zoom Hunter Zolomon was already starting off life with a bit of a disadvantage, and that's because his dad was a notorious killer who lost his life to the police after taking the life of Hunter's mother. So yeah, it was pretty bad. Trying to move on with his life though, Hunter became obsessed with understanding the criminal mind, studying psychology and criminology in college, and eventually joining the FBI alongside his girlfriend, whom he later married. Nice. Unfortunately though, during one case, Hunter made a bad call regarding a criminal they were after, and it resulted in Ashley's father losing his life. Hunter actually was correct, but the whole thing was orchestrated by Reverse Flash, Eobard Thawne. Ashley left Hunter and the FBI terminated his employment, leaving Hunter with a damaged knee due to the case and a cane for walking. After getting a job in Keystone City as a profiler, he was eventually paralyzed by Gorilla Grodd. After forming a relationship with Wally West, Hunter begged Flash to go back in time and change his life, but the speedster refused. Hunter took things into his own hands and stole the cosmic treadmill, which exploded, granting Hunter the power to live between the seconds of time and making him zoom the second reverse. Flash. Number 5 Superboy Prime Superboy Prime was initially a normal child on an Earth known as Prime Earth that didn't really have any superheroes. Or they had superheroes in the exact same way that we do, in comic books and entertainment media. This young future supervillain was adopted by Jerry and Naomi Kent, who named him Clark, which was both Naomi's middle name and the fictional comic book character Superman in their world. Well, it turns out that Clark really was Kal-El, teleported to Earth Prime before the Krypton of this universe was destroyed when its sun went kaboom. Discovering his Kryptonian abilities thanks to the passing of Halley's Comet, while coincidentally dressed as Superman at a Halloween party, this Superboy left his Prime Earth reality shortly afterwards. As it happens, the Earth-1 Superman just happened to be passing by and asked him to join other heroes in protecting reality itself from the Anti-Monitor during the Crisis on Infinite Earths. His reward, along with Alexander Luther Jr. of Earth-3, was a chance to escape to a heavenly pocket dimension where he doesn't age. Unfortunately, being able to watch the post-crisis Earth that was getting darker and darker without being able to be a part of it, losing his childhood, knowing that he could never grow up to be Superman, his idol of Earth 2, and feeling like the heroes of post-crisis Earth were absolute dog water, Superboy Prime became a pretty bitter guy. He escaped with Alexander and instigated the infinite crisis, and then he went on to be an incredibly despicable bad guy. Number 4 Doomsday Doomsday is essentially just pure destruction. He was able to bring down the Justice League and take the life of Earth's premier hero, Superman, in his first appearance. Doomsday doesn't speak. He can't be reasoned with, and the only way to stop him is to beat him harder than he will beat you. That's because Doomsday was created on the planet Krypton as the ultimate life form, tested against that planet's harsh environment and eventually against the Kryptonians themselves. Doomsday's whole life cycle involves it being killed and then coming back stronger than whatever took it out. Over decades and decades that involved literal thousands of repeated deaths, Doomsday essentially became a nearly undefeatable monster with no other thought process beyond destroying everything in front of him and just moving on to the next thing. All he does is punch things to pieces, and the only way to stop him is to try and punch him to pieces however you can before he can punch you to pieces. Number 3 The Maestro Hulk Maestro is the dystopian future version of the Hulk, the variant of Hulk that haunts his own dreams. He rules over the creatively named city, Dystopia, as an incredibly evil and immoral dictator. Years and years and years of radiation due to the nuclear conflict that spawned this dystopian future had made Maestro sick and villainous, as well as twice as strong as the base level Hulk, but with all the intelligence of Banner to boot. This bearded green behemoth has been a fan favorite character since his introduction in the future Imperfect storyline, and his backstory, fighting the Human Torch, Doctor Doom, Namor the Submariner and Abomination 
is pretty intense and it's a super fun read. Not to mention his debut where he fights the Incredible Hulk and defeats him like it's absolutely nothing to him. Super cool. You should check it out. Number 2 Vulcan The third and youngest Summers brother, Gabriel Summers, has been used by multiple different parties since his birth. His mother, Catherine Summers, had her life taken by the Shi'ar Emperor Deccan as a punishment for his father, Christopher Summers' own actions. He was basically paying for his father's crimes, which sucks. The Shi'ar took Gabriel and artificially aged him up and essentially used him back on Earth. So he was robbed of his childhood, which essentially meant that Vulcan has a tendency to act like a huge brat sometimes. It's a big old baby. After being saved and mentored by Maura McTaggart, Vulcan was drafted into an early team of Professor X's X-Men that got almost completely perished at the hands of Krakoa. Professor X then used his powers to wipe everyone's mind of the memory of this team of X-Men, which was incredibly messed up. Unbeknownst to Xavier though, Vulcan absorbed the energies of his teammates and was actually able to survive, spending years in Earth's orbit just kind of inert and floating there, until the events of M-Day awoke him. After coming back and fighting the X-Men and Xavier for some understandable vengeance, Gabriel took off into space and essentially took control of the Shi'ar Empire, marrying the black sheep of the Shi'ar royal family and using his massive power to beat the royal guard, take the life of Deccan, and place himself on the throne. And finally, in at number one, it's Thanos. Look, I know we all love Thanos as a villain. He's terribly ruthless, massively intelligent, and sickeningly powerful. But my lord, is his origin messed up. Thanos was born on Titan, a moon of Saturn, and is technically an Eternal. Unfortunately though, Thanos was born with a deviant gene, which made him very different looking from the rest of the Titan Eternals, with purple thick hide like skin and a much larger body. These differences caused Thanos' mom to try and change his life status from alive to lights out, and when that failed, he was ruthlessly bullied as he grew up. As such, Thanos wasn't the happiest child, and he distanced himself from his society, instead investing himself in science, life and death, and he also started dissecting animals all Dahmer-like. Thanos found he has a thing for death. In fact, he met and started to fall in love with the literal, physical embodiment of death in Marvel Comics, Mistress Death. To prove his love for her, he would commit some of the worst crimes, starting with the dissection of his mom, the bombardment of his home world, and eventually assembling the Infinity Stones and trying to wield the cosmic cube to destroy all life in the universe. At number 10 is Calendar Man. So you think you've heard all the villain origin stories, huh? Well, have you ever met Julian Day, the Calendar Man? This guy's obsession with time and dates would make even the most punctual person seem laid back. He'd celebrate holidays like nobody's business, but his calendar fixation led to some serious mental unraveling. You see, he dabbled in a life of crime with a unique twist, pulling off heists tied to specific calendar dates. Batman being the king crusader he is, couldn't resist, and the two engaged in an ongoing dance of cat and mouse. But here's the twist, after some stints in Arkham Asylum, Julian somehow became a useful asset to Batman. He helped him crack the case of the holiday unaliver, a case that the calendar man himself was initially the prime suspect for. Nowadays, Julian's obsession has evolved into metahuman abilities, as he ages and regenerates with the seasons. Winter brings wrinkles in spring, well, it's like a youth serum turning him into a newer, younger version of himself. Just goes to show even the weirdest obsessions can lead to some unexpected supervillain stories. At number 9 is Ice Cream. So if you haven't heard of him, Ice Cream is a minor villain who only appeared in the obnoxious The Clown number 1 X-Men comic. Ice Cream is a mutant supervillain with the power to turn his entire body into any flavor of ice cream. That's right. In his ice cream form, he can change his shape, melting into a puddle to slip under a door. His costume is made of unstable molecules so it can turn into ice cream along with him and then change back. His origin story is that people laughed at him because of his ridiculous powers and he blamed the X-Men because their incredible powers made his look ridiculous in comparison. So he made a plan to destroy them so that everyone would respect him. He also made ice cream puns like Lickety Banana Split and Easy As Pie a la Mode and at one point he even said curses like a typical cartoon villain. If you're enjoying the video so far please support the channel by pressing like 
like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. And number eight is the Rainbow Rider. Roy G. Bivolo, aka the Rainbow Rider, is not your typical comic book villain. Growing up, Roy had dreams of becoming a famous artist, but there's a catch. He was colorblind. While other kids were out playing, Roy spent his time perfecting his craft, only to be met with disdain for his art due to his inability to see the true beauty of colors. But Roy's story takes an even darker turn. His father, an optometrist and optical tech expert, vowed to find a way to cure his son's condition. Tragically, he passed away before he could fulfill that promise. But before he could, Roy's father handed him a pair of goggles that he had been developing. These goggles had the power to emit solid rainbow colored light beams, which I mean, kind of misses the target a little bit. Fueled by bitterness over his failed artistic pursuits and his father's unfulfilled promise, Roy chose a different path. He embarked on a life of crime, using the goggles to create chaos and establish himself as the Rainbow Raider. At number seven is Shaggy Man. No, it's not Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, although I wish it was. This guy was actually a freaky creation of Dr. Andrew Zagarian, who was just trying to find a substitute for lost human tissue. He whipped up something called Plast alloy and decided to beef it up with a dash of salamander DNA. But here's where everything goes south for science. A big old human error occurred and this artificial body he was working on turned into a hulking hairy giant he cleverly named the Shaggy Man. No PhD required to see where this is going. The Shaggy Man goes bonkers attacking anything that moves. Plus it can regrow any body part that it loses thanks to its salamander DNA. The doctor was in way over his head and had to call in the Justice League for backup. But even then those superheroes couldn't handle this monstrosity. But leave it to the Flash to come up with a genius solution. He tells the doctor to create another Shaggy Man, and then they toss these immortal beasts into a deep pit where they're stuck battling each other for all eternity. At number six is Victoria Murdoch. The villainess known as the Asbestos Lady had a burning grudge against the original Human Torch. To face the fiery hero, she decided to deck herself out in a fireproof asbestos suit, making her nearly invincible to the Human Torch. But she craved more power and tried to strong arm her scientist friend Fred Raymond into enhancing her asbestos abilities. The torch kept a close eye on Raymond's home and thwarted her plans. Fueled by revenge, the Abestos lady caused a train wreck to off the Raymonds, but their son Thomas survived unscathed. She tracked his fire resistant talents as he joined a circus act, but again, the torch foiled her plans by melting her boots to the road. Then in 1947, her twin brother Murdoch met his end at the hands of the torch and Toro. Abestos lady resolved to wipe them out as she lured them into traps, inducing an asbestos those lined net but they survived. But despite her escape attempts and alliances with villains, the asbestos lady ended up behind bars, vowing vengeance. However, she eventually succumbed to mesothelioma, probably due to all that asbestos exposure. At number five is Fred Myers, the Boomerang Man. Have you ever heard of a villain who started off as a pro baseball player? No? Well, let me introduce you to Boomerang, AKA Fred Myers. He's not your typical bad guy. You see, back in the day, he was swinging for the fences in the baseball world. But then he got suspended for taking bribes. That's right, he went from hitting home runs to hitting people. But wait, it gets crazier. A criminal organization came knocking on his door and Fred joined the dark side as an assassin. He worked for some big names like Justin Hammer, the Kingpin, the Masters of Evil, and even the Sinister 12. Then he had a brief stint as a hero during the Marvel Universe Civil War, going by the name Outback. But of course, he couldn't resist the allure of the criminal life for long. Now he's a part of the Thunderbolts, a team of reformed supervillains. Boomerang's not just any run-of-the-mill bad guy either. He's a sharpshooter with a lethal arsenal of customized boomerangs from explosives to tear gas. So the next time you see a baseball game, remember that not all athletes stick to playing fair. At number four is Leapfrog. An unusual and relatively obscure villain in the Marvel Universe offers not one, but two intriguing origin stories. First, we have Vincent Petilio, a struggling inventor who decided to take matters into his own hands. Frustrated with his lack of success, he crafted a frog-like suit equipped with electric leaping coils. Sadly for him, Daredevil foiled his criminal aspirations not once, but twice. And later, Iron Man joined the party, ensuring Patilio's stint in jail. Fast forward to post-prison life where financial hardship followed the tragic loss of Patilio's wife to 
cancer. His son Eugene took up the mantle as Frogman, causing some father-son superhero drama. But then when the villainess White Rabbit resurfaced, Batilio went undercover to help the police, leading to a unique family showdown against the White Rabbit. Next, let's talk about Buford Lang, a bad dad who stumbled into a leapfrog costume. His encounter with Daredevil on a rooftop took a shocking twist involving his own son Timmy, who didn't want to see Daredevil hurt. This electrifying turn of events led to Lang's unfortunate demise until he was eventually resurrected, of course. This is comic books. At number three, meet the Sultan of Sauce, the Condiment King. If you've seen the Lego Batman movie or the Harley Quinn animated series, you've encountered this master of salvary savagery. In the Lego movie spin-off, he joined the Joker's gang attacking Gotham, and in Harley Quinn, he's Poison Ivy's Kite Man rival. Yep, the Condiment King is a real DC villain, though he's not exactly keeping Batman up at night. Batman the Animated Series introduced him where he fell under Joker's control, who made him wield condiments as weapons. Before his spicy turn, he was Buddy Sandler, a comedian brainwashed by the Joker to threaten people with ketchup and mustard at a fancy restaurant. In the comics, his real name was Michelle Mayo, a name that doesn't exactly command respect. But in Birds of Prey number 37, he concocted a poison that sent Blue Beetle, Black Canary, and Robin into anaphylactic shock. Deliciously evil, am I right? At number two, Clock King's comic history is a curious tale of obscurity turned cool. See, back in the 1960s, he made his debut in the world's finest comics number 111, a crook who really, really loved clocks. And well, that's about it. Over the next two decades, he only popped up a couple more times in some of the world's finest backup stories. One of those tried to give him a backup story, but it was really only a half-hearted attempt at best. However, the 1980s came to the rescue with the creation of the Injustice Gang. This group of largely forgotten villains, formed for laughs in the Justice League comics, breathed new life into characters like Clock King. But the real turning point for him was Batman the Animated Series. See, they took this obscure clock-loving crook and turned him into something awesome. The updated designs and new motivations struck a chord with fans, and suddenly, the Clock King was Vogue. At number one is Polka Dot Man. His mom was a scientist obsessed with superheroes, and she decided to take a leap into the unknown. See, she worked at Star Labs, and in her quest to turn her kids into caped crusaders, she exposed Abner to an interdimensional virus. Now what happened next is something like out of a horror sci-fi flick. See, Abner's skin starts sprouting these weird glowing polka dots and lumps, and it's not a fashion statement. Some of his siblings, they didn't make it. They paid the price for their mom's experiments, but Abner, well, he survived, but at a cost. He had to expel those polka dots twice daily just to prevent the virus from munching on his insides. Now what's more is because of his mom's twisted experiments, Abner got PTSD. He sees his mom's face in every person he looks at, like an unending horror show in his head. And while he might not be too fond of unaliving people, he's got a twisted way to motivate himself. See, he imagines his targets as his own mother. Eventually, he ended up behind bars in Belle Reve Penitentiary, but he would eventually go on to be recruited by Amanda Waller as part of a new squad, and I'm sure you all know the rest. A number of villains were created specifically for the 1966 Batman show, Egghead being one of them. He is an egotistical, egg-obsessed man whose brain is too big for his head, which is why it's so long. This man is pretty exceptional. He was a professor at Gotham Academy. He eventually turned to a life of crime, working with the likes of the Riddler. It's unclear why he stepped into villainhood. Maybe one day he just cracked. During his villain activities, he met a woman and fell in love but she didn't want to marry until Egghead was better off financially, so he hatched a plan to take over the city. This did not go over easy for him, and he was foiled by Batman. He later tried to hatch a dinosaur, which Batman did not omelette that slide, and defeated him again. He's gone from the screen to the page to the big screen in various cameos. Egghead is one of the only villains to figure out that Bruce Wayne is Batman due to the enormous expense of the heroes. He used clues about Batman's mannerisms to make the connection. One of my personal irrational fears is that my Adam and whatever I'm currently touching's atoms will line up perfectly and I will be painfully fused into whatever that thing is. In our world, I know that's not scientifically possible, but in the Marvel Universe, it seems to be. Maybe. In Spidey Super Stories 8, Spider-Man encounters a man fused with a wall, making him the wall. He was a regular kid until an accident at work permanently altered his being. The accident
accident being an entire brick wall coming crashing down on him. It's not really explained how he fuses with the bricks, but the only semi plausible reason I can think of is their atoms lining up, which hopefully they'll line up again and he can be freed. We only see him in Spidey stories, but he was based on a character created for the Electric Company TV show. The Spidey Super Stories and the show went hand in hand. The show was designed to entice kids to practice speech and writing, as were the Spidey comics. Marvel provided Spidey to the channel for free, and he wasn't the only big name there. Morgan Freeman and Rita Moreno starred as well. As for the wall, we don't see him again until a profile on the Marvel Strike Force website goes up. Batman's valet Alfred is a saint and deserves nothing but good things. So why did the creators of Detective Comics feel the need to crush him with a boulder, have his body kidnapped and experimented on, and brought back to life Frankenstein style, turning him into a villain wanting to kill his family? I don't get it. After the experiments are done on his near dead body, his mind and body have been twisted into reverse, so all the love he felt for Batman and Robin is now hatred for Batman and Robin. The Outsider is a physically separate being from Alfred. Alfred is stuck in a coma like state. In the final battle between the Outsider and Batman and Robin, Batman figures out how to get Alfred back to normal. The unfortunate part is that the Outsider is still inside Alfred and every once in a while comes out again. Marvel creates some interesting characters, like an elf hitman. His name is Melf. M E L F, but his alias is Elf with a Gun, and that's it. That's what he is. It seems that he's part of a bigger group, Elves with Guns. We don't know where he's from officially, but the Elves with Guns are agents for the tribunals, a force dedicated to preserving order in the universe. Melf was a weird guy. He would go around offing random people, and he was never caught. He was only stopped because he was run over by a truck. His nephew, Ralph, then took up his undisclosed mission. However, if we look at him like he was working for the tribunals, then maybe Maybe his victims weren't as random. This would be a great and easy to follow explanation for everything, which is why it has been disproven. Turns out the tribunals were fake, and we are once again back to wondering why a killer elf was roaming the streets. The Phantom Stranger has led a lot of lives, literally. One might be canon now, but it's only a matter of time before someone else grabs a pen and messes with his history. His current origin in the New 52 story is that he was Judas, betrayer of Jesus, and that makes him one of the greatest sinners that has ever lived. Another is that he was a fallen angel who didn't pick a side during the heavenly war. Another is that he was Isaac from the Bible story. Not exactly the same though, this time his son died because King Herod was looking for Jesus, and now Isaac hates Jesus and later tore him. Another is that he was spared during biblical times but didn't want to be, but the angels didn't want to let him in heaven so he has to walk the earth alone forever. And the fourth is that he was actually one of the last remaining parts of our previous universe. At the final curtain he approaches those studying the end and passes a part of himself onto a new person so when the universe is reborn they get a phantom stranger too. In addition to his many backstories it is also up in the air as to whether or not he is a villain. To me, I think he started out as a villain, he did betray Jesus in at least a few of these, but later realized the error of his ways and became a sort of hero. Lots of people just choose to ignore many new 52 storylines, so I guess we'll just have to wait and see what sticks for Phantom. Phantom Stranger is now connected to a villain called Question, but that wasn't always the case. Question at one point was a character that was thought to be a supernatural power, thought to be because it was never made clear. One of the only things that is now considered canon about him is that he has committed a crime bad enough to be considered one of three of the world's greatest sinners, part of the trio of sin with Phantom. We never know this guy's name. Before being turned into question, the guy was obsessed with power and having his name feared by all. As his punishment, he got his face taken away and he can no longer remember himself or his name. This was introduced in the New 52. Before that, he was just an alter ego of Vic Sage, but then Flashpoint caused them to separate and even have a brand new, different history thing going on. This version of him isn't that bad, he just really wants to know who he is. He also shares a name with a Taylor Swift song, it's all very confusing. I am hoping that we will eventually get a name reveal out of him, whether he's another universe version of an existing Marvel villain, or if he's really a historical figure. Identity theft and retcons have led to quite a confusing backstory for Zorn. Zorn's debut was in New X-Men Annual 2001, and at the end, he was revealed to be Magneto in disguise. Only he wasn't. Later it was revealed that it was actually Zorn pretending to be Magneto, pretending to be Zorn. And Zorn was being controlled by someone named Sublime to 
foster mutant hatred in the world. Easy to follow. At the end of the Magneto identity theft fight, Zorn dies, but not really. His body is done for, but his essence was still around through his connection to Sublime, so he came back. The creator of Zorn in 2001 always intended for Zorn to be Magneto, actually Magneto. So when you read the story, there are hints to it the whole way through. It was because the editors liked Zorn's character, and Marvel wanted Magneto alive so they could use him again, that the confusing aspect of his story was born. Zorn also has a twin brother with very similar powers to him, so sometimes Zorn returns, but it's Zorn 1, or it's not Zorn 1, and it's actually Zorn 2, it's a whole thing. Duella Dent's origin is confusing because she wants it to be. She is a pathological liar when it comes to her family tree. She is claimed to be the daughter of the Joker, Catwoman, the Riddler, the Penguin, Scarecrow, and Two-Face, and even more. She was first introduced as the Joker's daughter, but her last name is Dent, the same name belonging to Harvey Dent, or Two-Face. So now she is known as Two-Face's daughter for a while, until Robin figures out she's not the right age to be his daughter. She agrees and then just disappears. She appeared in the Team Titans comic series, and she was planned to be revealed as a time traveler that gets reality warped one too many times and is driven insane. Unfortunately, we never got to see this as the comics were cancelled. Technically, Duella doesn't want to be a villain, but she does fight a lot of heroes and lies all the time. She was later revealed to actually legit be the daughter of another universe Joker and Three-Face, a female variation of Two-Face. Is this a lie? Maybe. You can literally never know what's real in these universes anymore. Turns out, neither can Duella. It's suggested that because her mind was warped so much, every time she switched Earths, her consciousness switches slightly as well, which is why she's named so many different parents. She was just confused. The Joker is one of the most iconic villains of all time, so it's no wonder so many people want to leave their mark on his story. Unfortunately, that makes for a pretty messed up, twisted, confusing history. One thing is common, he ends up in acid and comes out looking like that. Who he was before, and even during the swim, is up to whoever is holding the pen. In 1951's Detective Comics 168, the Joker had been the Red Hood, also a criminal, and one night he decided to rob a factory. He escaped by swimming through the pool of chemical wastes, and I genuinely think he thought he would come out normal. He didn't, and to his delight figured out his new look was scary and used it to his advantage. In later versions, like The Killing Joke in 1988, he is a failing comedian and once again finds himself in the chemical factory, but but this time he gets scared into the acid. In Batman the Animated Series, he was a hitman first. In the very recent and Oscar worthy interpretation from Joaquin Phoenix, is that he didn't fall in the acid yet. His look is just makeup and he has a neurological disorder that makes him randomly laugh. There is another movie coming up with Lady Gaga as Harley, so maybe the acid will make an appearance then too. Time for the big guy, the MCU's newest big bad wolf and my never ending headache, Kang the Conqueror. One thing seems to generally stay consistent every version of Kang starts out as Nathaniel Richards. Where Nathaniel comes from? We have options. There was a Nathaniel from Earth 616 that brought peace to Earth 6311 when he traveled there. This made him a big deal. He was known as the legendary benefactor. But he wasn't the Nathaniel native to the planet, so another Nathaniel was eventually born. This Nathaniel was maybe descended from the great benefactor himself or Doctor Doom. This Nathaniel's history was messed up by another him, causing him to be a good guy for a while. Nathaniel grows up and is bored, so he travels travels back in time to Earth 616's ancient Egypt. His plans? Be king. Eventually he tries to return home after losing some fights, but is caught in a time storm and transported ahead to the 40th century Earth 6311. The future is a mess, they are at war again, and the people have regressed into barbarians. Nathaniel has found the perfect group to take over. This is the first time he takes on the name Kang the Conqueror. He took his name and ran, conquering Earth 6311, that galaxy, and then trying to attack Earth 616. He wanted more power but there was also a historical record that said that eventually a celestial Madonna was going to give birth to the most powerful entity ever, and Kang wanted to be their dad. This was the confusing origin of one version of Kang, but generally considered to be the base Kang kind of. There are so many versions of him under a variety of names. Nathaniel, Kang, Immortus, Scarlet Centurion, Victor Timely, Mr. Griffin, Prime Kang, and Kang the Conglomerator. At number 10 is Black Bolt. Black Bolt? Bolt, aka Blackagar Boltagon, yup, that's his actual name, 
had an undeniably tough start. Exposed to the Terrigan Mists while still in the womb, he gained a staggering power a voice capable of toppling buildings and even obliterating entire worlds. His arrival into the world wasn't subtle. His mere cries crumbled the structure around him when he was born. But from the moment of birth, Black Bolt was treated not as a person, but as a weapon of mass destruction. Isolation was his fate until the age of 19, and he was forbidden to utter a single word due to his uncontrollable power, spending the first two decades of his life in absolute silence. Now let's take a moment here to appreciate the image of a grown black Black Bolt decked out in a superhero outfit sitting in his isolation chamber. I mean, come on, dude. Casual attire is an option. I mean, even the Joker doesn't wear purple at the Arkham Asylum. If you're enjoying this video so far, you can support this channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. Really appreciate it. At number 9 is Rorschach. Rorschach's backstory reads like a descent into a nightmarish abyss. A childhood entrenched in squalor with a mother who lived a life of night walking, set the tone for his grim trajectory. Bullied at school, Rorschach's retaliation marked his entry into the world of crime. But it was a chance encounter with a shifting, enigmatic dress that catalyzed his transformation. Crafting his ink-blotted mask, he embraced the persona of Rorschach. In the world of vigilantism, he crossed paths with Night Owl and the other Watchmen, but a horrifying case left an indelible scar. Investigating a girl's abduction, he stumbled upon an unspeakable brutality. Her remains had been fed to dogs. His retribution was unflinching, handcuffing the perpetrator amidst flames, and a gruesome ultimatum pushed the boundaries of his morality. As time went on, the line between Rorschach and Walter Korvax blurred. His mask became his face, obscuring his true self. In a twisted metamorphosis, Korvax perished and Rorschach emerged. This brutal origin story epitomizes the haunting complexity of Watchmen's characters, where darkness begets something darker. At number 8 is Red Hood. The only thing more tragic than Jason Todd's backstory is the fact that the decision to end his character was the result of a vote by fans via telephone poll. Born into Gotham and raised as the second ever Robin to Bruce's Batman, Todd's journey into heroism wasn't paved by rose petals. He met a tragic fate at the hands of the Joker when Batman's notorious nemesis whacked him mercilessly with a crowbar and left him strapped next to a bomb. Todd's demise marked the stark divergence from your typical heroic tragedy. Miraculously surviving his grim fate via some mystic shenanigans, probably involving the Lazarus Pit, he returned with a newfound edginess, embracing a more anti-hero persona as the Red Hood, which, by the way, is the Joker's original moniker. This gritty transformation challenges the traditional archetype of a superhero, delving into the complexities of vengeance, morality, and blurred lines. It seems that the darkest of beginnings can give rise to the extraordinary, if not unconventional, champions. At number 7 is Spider-Man. Spider-Man's origin story is a gripping tale of tragedy and transformation. Orphaned at an early age, he was raised by his uncle Ben and Aunt May, growing up with a resilient spirit despite being bullied for his intellect and physicality. The twist, however, arrives when a radioactive spider bite gr grants him superpowers, turning Peter Parker into the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. But the heart-wrenching moments don't stop there. The weight of responsibility intensifies when Uncle Ben is eliminated, largely due to Peter's inaction. See, because he got ripped off after winning his wrestling gig, he didn't mind when the place got robbed. Not until the robber went on to pew pew his uncle in the street outside. This shattering loss becomes a driving force, propelling Spider-Man to navigate his dual life of newfound gravity. The web slinger evolves from a carefree teen to a vigilant guardian, learning that great power demands great responsibility. At number 6, Daredevil. Daredevil, the man without fear, but with a lot of misfortune. Meet Matt Murdock. Picture a young Murdoch full of good intentions attempting to save a pedestrian, but fate had other plans for him. At this moment, a radioactive substance blinds him. Not exactly a radioactive spider bite, but hey, it's Marvel. And then it gets even darker. His dad, just a hardworking boxer, ends up in the crosshairs of some ruthless gangsters. Murdoch Sr. takes the fall, leading young Matt down a path of vengeance. But then it gets even worse. His love interest, Karen Page, she takes a dark turn too, selling out Daredevil's secret identity while under the influence, only then to be by the sadistically accurate bullseye. Ouch. So here's Daredevil's origin in a nutshell. Blinded, avenging his father, dealing with loss, and grappling with betrayal. No wonder the guy's got issues. His life is like a masterclass in tragic backstories. At number five is The Flash. You know, when it comes to superhero origin stories, we often expect a certain level of tragedy. But Barry Allen's tale took an unexpected twist. You see, back in the day, his mother's fate wasn't the driving force behind the superhero persona. No, she was just in a coma for a little while. But then Crisis on Infinite Earths happened, things got shifted around, and 
suddenly, Barry's life became a roller coaster of sorrow. Enter Flash Rebirth, where the writers decided, hey, let's pile on that trauma. Now, Nora, Barry's mom, didn't just fade away quietly. No, she was brutally And guess who's to blame? Yup, his own dad. Imagine that. But the plot gets even juicier, as we can all blame the time-meddling antics of Eobor Thon, aka Reverse Flash. This guy goes back in time, torches Barry's home, and impales Nora, all just to mess with Barry's head. Talk about holding a grudge across timelines. It's like a soap opera with capes. At number four is Wolverine. Wolverine's origin story is like a psychological roller coaster that you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. The dude's life is a series of unfortunate events that would make Lemony Snicket's eyebrows raise in surprise. Imagine being a sickly kid only to have your mutation pop up right after your real dad eliminates your foster dad. Then in a fit of rage-fueled vengeance, you off your biological father, leading your mom to think, oh, that's it for me, and take her own exit. Our angsty protagonist bolts with his buddy Rose, hoping to catch a breather. Just your regular tale of friendship and healing, right? Wrong. Q is half-brother's dramatic entrance, and oops, Logan's blades accidentally find their way into poor old Rose. I mean, come on, talk about life kicking you when you're down. At number three is Silver Surfer, a character steeped in cosmic tragedy. Norin Rad, hailing from the planet Zen La, has an origin that's nothing short of gut-wrenching. Forced by the cosmic juggernaut Galactus, who thrives on consuming entire worlds, Rad becomes Galactus's herald. This means sourcing the cosmos for energy-rich planets to satisfy his master's insatiable hunger. At first, it doesn't seem too terrible, just avoid planets with intelligent life, right? But such planets are rare, and as guilt piles up leading Galactus to inhabited worlds, the Silver Surfer's sanity begins to fray. Galactus, recognizing this, stifles Rad's emotions, reducing him to a mere husk. Imagine being shackled to his cosmic master's whims, his vibrant self buried under cosmic servitude. It's a tale of sacrifice, remorse, and the battle for identity woven into the fabric of the universe. At number two, the Incredible Hulk. When we delve into the origin story of the Hulk, the surface level equation of Bruce Banner plus gamma radiation might seem straightforward, but the story goes much, much deeper. Sure, exposure to gamma radiation plays a pivotal role in his transformation, but why the emotional roller coaster once he's green? The answer is as complex as Bruce's psyche. Unraveling the threads leads us to Bruce's tumultuous past and the haunting figure of his father, Brian. Brian Banner's exposure to gamma radiation triggered a genetic alteration that echoed down the family tree, affecting Bruce as well. Yet it's not just the altered genes that shaped the Hulk's fury. Brian wasn't just a victim of radiation, he was a tormentor and abuser. He was a tormentor. His malevolent actions scarred Bruce's childhood. The emotional turmoil and the inability to control his anger stem from these deep-rooted traumas. The Hulk isn't just a product of scientific mishaps, it's the manifestation of the interplay between genetics and psychological wounds. A stark reminder that our origins can't be boiled down to a simple formula. And at number one, Batman. Batman, the very mention of his name conjures up thoughts of darkness, brooding nights, and a city in need of a savior. But peel back the layers of his iconic persona and you'll uncover a profoundly tragic origin story that's etched into the annals of pop culture history and into every single one of his movies. Picture this, a young Bruce Wayne, innocent and wide-eyed, out for a faithful night with his parents. Suddenly, tragedy strikes in the form of a dark alley and the chilling sound of pew pew pew. His parents, pillars of hope, fall before his eyes, victim of this heartless act. The, imp the impact of that moment is immeasurable and it carves a permanent scar in his soul. Now despite being left with wealth beyond measure, now despite being left with that, now despite being left with wealth beyond measure and a loyal butler in the name of Alfred, Bruce is burdened with unrelenting emptiness. His goal, his life goal becomes an unending quest to rid Gotham of its malevolent underbelly, driven by an unwavering desire for justice and vengeance. The bat was born from the ashes of that night, a symbol of the darkness that took so much from him and the light he aims to restore. Proving that even in the harshest crucibles of fate, heroes can emerge with unyielding strength and unwavering determination. These stories serve as a testament to the resilience of the human spirit, the capacity to endure unfathomable suffering, and the power to transform adversity into inspiration. So the next time you witness a superhero soaring through the skies, just remember the incredible journeys that led them there. Journeys that we can hardly believe happened.